Well, hi, church. Uh, can't believe we're on our our last teaching of this fantastic Belong series. Hope you've been blessed. We're wrapping up this Why Church series by by talking about activating our witness, our evangelistic potential. We talked about last week um, activating our spiritual gifts, the difference that makes. But there's another huge part of why we have a church. And that is that together we might effectively share and show the good news of Jesus to the world. And John chapter 20, Jesus after his resurrection gathers his disciples in verse 21. Uh, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you don't, they are not. And Jesus kind of summarizes everything. I was sent to the world, but now I'm sending you. We are not just here to be saved. We're here to be sent. <laughs> You know, one of the ways that we look at it is God so loved the world he gave his only son. But the other half of that, God so loves the world that he gives his only church because we are to be the hands, feet of Jesus. And there's a purpose bigger than us. I, I like to say the church is the only organization that exists for its non-members. Unlike the world's clubs and organization from the very beginning, when Jesus started this church, he said, you, you know, you are not a country club. You are a rescue mission. You are to be on the very front lines of people who are dying. And you're to be going out on that raft and pulling them in as fast as, as you can. This is why the church exists. And what we want to see today is that when we keep that as the driving purpose of the church in our life, then we become passionate and powerful Christians. When we leave that first love, you know, the difference between an on-fire church and a dead church is simple. An on-fire church is driven by what drove Jesus. And what we said Sunday is Jesus was driven by one thing, Luke 19.10. I've come to seek and to save what was lost. That's why in that whole passage in Luke 19, Jesus comes into Jericho, zips right past the religious synagogue, the political leaders, and goes to have lunch with the most notorious sinner in the whole town named Zacchaeus. And as he reaches out to him, Zacchaeus you know, was a cheater and had stolen and was the tax collector and and salvation comes and, you know, Zacchaeus starts saying, I'm going to give away a third of my money and I'm going to give back everything I've stolen and he's just all, all excited and Jesus, you can see him just smiling. I can see a big tear running down Jesus' face and he says, that's why the Son of Man came. I came for lost people. I came because there's only one thing that makes heaven party, <laughs> and that's when, when someone comes to Jesus. You know, Luke, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul says the same thing. He says, what drives me? He says, I will do anything. I will become all things to all people that I might win uh, them to Christ. Again, I want you to see that because what drives us determines where we end up. And, you know, what's sad to me is they did a survey once of uh, average church members. 90% of the church members they interviewed said that the reason the church exists is to meet the needs of their family. <laughs> Only 10% said the purpose of the church is, is to reach the lost. And yet what happens, and this is why I'm passionate, because this is why we started Heart for the World was to exist for non-members. And that God showed us that if we would have a heart for the world, he would take good care of us. 
And I often tell that story, how when I was over in Japan, I'd been on a mission trip. But we, we didn't have a building to live in or anything else. But the Lord says, Dale, I want to show something to you. Because you built my church in the nations, I'll build you a church. And the next thing you know, within that year, this remarkable building that we have came into our possession. In other words, God's saying, if you will keep your heart uh, based upon making an eternal difference, then I will take care of you. And, and what to me is so huge is wherever the church lives with this fire, there's revival. When I was, was raised in this youth movement called Jesus Chapel, I mean, we saw 2,000 people come to the Lord in a little over a two-year period. I can't tell you how excited we were. Every service was like, we would get there a couple hours early. I mean, we just, and you know, you look back on it, you say, well, what was the fire all about? And, and I'll tell you, it had nothing to do with how good the music was. It was weak. <laughs> the sermons were super weak. All It had nothing to do with a, with a program. But every week we gathered because people would bring their, their unsaved friends. And at the end, a dozen, up to a hundred of them would accept the Lord and we would go crazy and we would just live for that. God wants that fire uh, in our church again and in each one of our lives. And that comes when we begin to see that we have been saved and put into a church for a mission. Emil Bruner says, as oxygen is to fire, so mission is is to the church. This oxygen that we we call having an eye for people immediately gives us what I call an eternal perspective towards life. There's, There's two kinds of lives that we can live. One life is all about here. Jesus talked about building two houses, you know, one built on sand, one built on rock. And and there's a lot of ways to look at that. But one way to look at that is everything we do with our life that's about getting stuff, taking care of stuff, worrying about stuff, <laughs> um, earning stuff, uh, you know, being successful in the eyes because of others because of our stuff. All of that is a part of, of a life that we're building that the Bible says it's all going to crash. It's all going in the trash at the end. James Dobson uh, talked about how he went back for his high school 30th reunion or something like that. And they went to his old high school and they had won a lot of different trophies. He was an athlete and they had these trophies for, for uh, track and there was band trophies he had won, help win. And when he got there, he saw the janitor putting all those trophies in, in the trash. He says, what are you doing? He says, oh, we got so many trophies in our case. We got new trophies. They, they, they always end up in the trash. And God just spoke to him. He said, everything of this world that you are working for is gonna end up in the trash. We had a little saying growing up, one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. And this other house that we build is everything we do to help either people come to Jesus or grow in Jesus. And that is gonna last forever. Um, I love the verse it says in Luke 16, 9 in the God's Word translation. I'm telling you that although wealth is used in dishonest ways, you should use it to make friends for yourselves. So when life is over, you will be welcomed into an eternal home. That's Luke 16, 9, good news translation. You know what he's saying? He's saying, yeah, it's cool to work for wealth. It's cool to be great in your career. It's cool to want to have a family. But whatever you do in life, think of it with an eternal perspective. How can I win people to the Lord with this? Because if you do that, when you get to heaven, there's going to be a real party. And the stuff you invested in here, you're going to enjoy forever. And the people that you reached will get to live forever. I've said the mission of our church is to give everyone in the world a chance to go to heaven and a chance to have heaven come to them, to find the Lord 
and to live the abundant life that Jesus died so that people could live. Jesus summarized it and called the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And I will be with you on this mission. He went on to say in Acts 1 8, you're going to receive power so that you can be a witness for me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to all the world. The very heartbeat of mission is, like I like to say it, helping people get a home in heaven and then helping heaven get into their home. One is evangelism, the other is discipleship. And that is why we exist. There's little kids in Zambia, there's little kids across the street. There's old people in a nursing home have a few more days and they don't know Jesus yet. There's neighbors, there's people who've come to church, they've accepted Jesus, but they don't have any idea what it means to live like a Christian. And Jesus said, this is the mission of the church. If you will do this, you'll make an eternal difference and people will live forever. How do we do it? Um, just summarizing, we, gotta, we, we change our mentality. We, we see the church not as a place to meet, not as an institution. The church is people going everywhere, meeting needs in Jesus' name. My mentor, John Wimber, told a story about a guy who came to the church and he came to complain to John. He said, you know, I've been to the church a few times and the last time I came, I, I ran into this homeless guy. I tried to take him, but nobody was at the church. And I, you know, I ended up having to take him to lunch and getting him some clothes and, and getting him into a place to stay. I tried again to call the church, no one was there. So then I had to take him to the bus station. And he said, hey, I just wanna know, when's the church gonna do something about homeless people? And John Wimber said, the church did something about homeless people, you're the church. And when people have the mentality, oh, oh, I'm the church. It's not just something we go to, it's something we are. And every place we go to Walmart, to work, we go on a mission. And that mission is to be salt and light. That mission, as 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, is to be an ambassador for Jesus. You know, the, the Las Cruces Public Schools may pay your paycheck, but your job is ambassador for Jesus at the public schools. Or wherever you go, wherever you work. So how do you how do you do it out there? Well, you you live the life. You know, as St. Francis said, preach the gospel all the time and when necessary, use words. You love people, you work with excellence. You have a caring attitude. But then secondly, you, you share your story. You know, there is something that will change in your life when you're not just a Christian, but you're a witness. When you take the lampshade off of you, you let the story out. And you don't have to be a great orator. You don't have to have a three-point sermon. I love this verse in Mark 5, 19 in the living. It says, Jesus told this man he healed, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. That's what it means to be a witness. Just care about people, listen to their story, and when you get a chance, just tell them what the Lord's done for you. And then finally, discover how your gifts and your personality, your temperament, your opportunity fits into God's plan to use the church corporately as a team to reach our city and the world. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8, Paul said, I, you know, I sowed, someone else watered, someone else reaped the harvest. Jesus said the same thing. Some people are planters, <laughs> some people harvest. Jesus is saying something very simple. If we want to maximize our evangelistic potential, if at the end of the day, we're going to see the most people that can be in heaven be in heaven, it'll be because 
we were a committed member of a church body. Because almost like an assembly line at Ford or whatever, the gift that you have is one part of a process that produces the, the witness, the environment, the opportunity for someone finally to cross the line of faith and be a fully devoted follower and grow as a disciple. And every one of you has an absolutely unique part to play. When we do it all together, we are unbelievable. <laughs> when each one of us, you know, uses, you may be, your gift may be hospitality and you may invite, you know, university students home for a meal. And you say, well, I just not very good at explaining the gospel. Hey, that's the gospel, inviting someone to eat. Someone else plays the drums. And when you play the drums, somebody who doesn't even know Jesus stomps their foot and they get into the music. And next thing you know, they hear the message, they get saved. You maybe hold babies in the nursery, but that way a single mom hears the story. All of this is preaching the gospel. I believe that there's kind of five basic parts of preaching the gospel. Praying, giving, telling the story, showing the story, and, and going. And every one of us kind of fits somewhere in there. Some of you, your biggest contribution is you're a giver. <laughs> and you send Bibles and everything like that. Others of you, it's praying. It's it's your inner Others of you, it's it's watering it's it's showing god's love you're just awesome at that others of you it's telling the story maybe by by preaching maybe by producing videos maybe by music some of you it's enfolding the people it's making a disciple because salvation isn't just getting a decision it's a disciple and it's taking a new christian and and helping them understand like Priscilla and Aquila did with Paul's. Here's how it works, you know. I'll sit with you at church. Hey, just come on, let's hang out. But when we're doing that together, we're fulfilling this great final purpose of the church, to be sent to change the world. God bless you.